Uh, Brendan B. Fish, I presume not his real name, on Twitter asks, speaking personally, do you believe that Robert, Ned, and John Aaron were justified in their rebellion against the Mad King? If it were you, would you have stayed loyal to the Targaryens? People in the audience are freaked out by this question for some <laughs> I don't think I would have stayed loyal to, uh, to the Mad King. Do I think they were justified? Yeah, yes and no. I don't like to provide easy answers to that. I like to make, <laughs> I like to make the reader uh, wrestle with the question mm -hmm. and, and think about it. Um, because some of these questions never are uh, easy when we encounter them in, in real life. Um, it's been interesting coming back here to Chicago Because I was, I spent 10 years in Chicago, in the Chicago area. I was at Northwestern from 1966 to 1971 up in Evanston. And then I was in Chicago from 71 to 76. And if you look at that era, particularly uh, the early part of that era, uh, the 60s, it was sometimes known in the history books for you young people who have read about it in history as the turbulent 60s. There was um, an altercation going down in Vietnam that some of us didn't like. There were a lot of protests and demonstrations. Um, people in the streets by the tens of thousands, by the hundreds of thousands in some cases. Um, and I look back on that era now and, and uh, you know, I ask myself that question. Did we, were the protests justified? Did we do the right thing? Did we do the wrong thing? Should we have gone further? to, uh, should, should we, um, you know, I was very much a, a clean for gene guy. I still believed in uh, the American system and, um, you know, elections and let's elect Gene McCarthy and put an end to Vietnam War that way. There were more radical people who wanted to destroy the state and tear it all down and rebuild it, you know. Um, and when I look at all the things that happened, uh, I don't know. It was a confused time, and it's still a confusing time to look back in history. Maybe 100 years from now, when everybody who participated in dead will be able to sort it out and find the answers. But uh, is violence ever justified to oppose evil in the world? If so, to what extent is violence justified? Um, and these are the questions that Ned and Robert had to, uh, had to deal with. There was no doubt that uh, the Mad King was mad. He, he was, uh, you know, paranoid and violent, and he was abusing his power. And Westeros has no Magna Carta or anything like that. There was no way to handle this within the rule of law. Uh, but was what they do justified? Especially when you consider that it was triggered by a personal mm -hmm. grievance, mm -hmm. the, the execution of Ned's father and, and brother was really a thing that radicalized, as we would have said in the 60s, Ned and, and put him uh, in, in opposition to it. Robert was just brawling for a fight and didn't like <laughs> the fact that he'd lost his girlfriend. Um, so, you know, the personal informs the political. Mm -hmm. I don't, as a reader, I like the writers who ask questions and get you to think. And I try to do that as a writer. I don't necessarily like the writers who give answers. Because often I don't agree with the answers. They seem <laughs> wrong to me in some cases, or they seem overly simplistic. Um, but questioning is important. Theodore Sturgeon, who was uh, one of the great, great science fiction writers of the Golden Age, uh, and a real individualist and, and free thinker, I think, he, he had a slogan which was called ask the, nest, ask the Next Question. And he wore it, he had a medallion that he wore in the last of life, a big Q with an arrow through it that stood for Ask the Next Question. And I always admired Sturgeon and his, uh, his views on that. Your answer about not giving answers was a very good answer. <laughs> Thank you. It was excellent. Um, okay, another question. This is from Lucifer Means Lightbringer, which I also presume is not this person's 
government name. Um, you have created several notable in-world mythical figures, which seem to serve as archetypes that are the main characters echo at times. Can you say a few words about your use of myth and internal folklore and the way those things interact with the main story and characters? Yeah, I've had a, a, a lot of fun. Well, it's, it's part of the world building process. I mean, um, every world, every culture has its, uh, has its myths, has its legends, has its heroes. Um, you know, I, I suspect everybody in this room, even if you haven't read the books or something, knows who Robin Hood was or a little about him or King Arthur um, and, uh, or maybe some of the American myths, Paul Bunyan. Or Spider-Man or Superman. Uh, right, mm -hmm. right. Um, and we refer to them occasionally. Uh, we, we make references to them. Uh, it's sometimes amazing to, to think of uh, the extent to which some of these ancient myths and ancient characters permeate our, our culture. You know, we watch football and somebody blows out his Achilles tendon. We're referring to a character from Homer, you know, who existed if he existed at all 3,000 years ago. And, uh, you know, his only vulnerability was his heel. And because of that, we're talking about an injury to a football player. It's, it's amazing. Um, so a mythical world, obviously I can't reference Achilles or Paul Bunyan or Spider-Man, but it has to have its own heroes and its own legends. And, and I try to put them in to, to give that flavor. I had a lot of, I don't know if, how many of you have read uh, my latest uh, Westeros book, Fire and Blood, uh, which is, um, thank you. Fire and Blood is a little different because it's, it's not part of a world of ice and fire, a song of ice and fire. It's a, a fake history book, imaginary history, uh, about the first 150 years of the Targaryen dynasty. And it's written in world, it's written by Archmaester Gildane at a citadel, 300 years after many of the events which he's uh, chronicling. So like a real historian, like someone writing now about the American Revolution, well, he wasn't there for the American Revolution. He has to go back and, and look at primary sources. So did Archmaster Gildane. And what you find out when you do that is the primary sources disagree. Um, they have different versions of events. Uh, one person said it happened this way. Another person said, no, that never happened. It happened this way. And uh, Archmaster Gildane, trying to be a good historian, is replicating all of the different versions. And that was a lot of fun for me because I could play with the whole concept of history, history being told by the winners, history being cleaned up and made politically correct or religiously correct. And I could present different versions of, of the various stories. And uh, that was, I enjoyed that. I think some of my readers enjoyed that too. Particularly the version of history told by Mushroom, the court fool, <laughs> who's, who always told everything in the most sexual, lascivious, and <laughs> shocking way possible, usually with himself as the hero. <laughs> and you have a history degree, so that was helpful. Well, I, not a history degree, but I... A history I, minor. A history minor, and, and I love history. I, re, I read a lot of... I'm not a historian by any means. I'm, I'm just a history nerd, mm -hmm. <laughs> I suppose you would say. <laughs> 